I think I will just go ahead and present the first speaker, our keynote <coughs> speaker, Simon Peyton Jones, one of the inventors of Haskell and uh, maintainer of the, uh, does it stand for the glorious Haskell compiler or the Glasgow Haskell compiler? Or it's not an optic Glasgow. Yeah, now it is glorious. So he's the <laughs> maintainer of the Haskell compiler and uh, famous keynote speaker in the functional programming world. So, welcome, Simon. Great joy to be here. Um, thank you for coming. And, and, and such like some visits. I, I was uh, um, don't visit Sweden all that often, but it's been twice in a week. <laughs> Last week was Aura, when I was uh, German, descending 40 degree slopes in the company of John Hughes. Uh, but here I am, alive and, and uh, with all limbs intact. So uh, this this book is built as a um, a kind of introduction to what what functional programming is and why I think it's important. And rather than giving you a kind of generic, you know, everything up in the air kind of why functional programming is a wonderful thing, I'm going to focus on one thing in particular to, uh, to anchor your minds on, that's this, uh, the, the challenge of taming effects. So I hope that you'll come away from this talk with at least one idea uh, clear in your mind. Uh, so we've got about, um, we've got 55 minutes total, including questions. Um, but let me encourage you to ask questions as I go along. Because otherwise what happens is that I get all excited speaking by myself and then, then I start to speak faster and faster and faster and, and, um, and you, uh, you may not even understand what I say when my output bandwidth becomes sufficiently high. So it would help me also to feel that you're listening if you ask some questions as we, as we went along. Right? So, and it's a, it's a, even though it's quite a lot of people, it's a small enough room so that you can do that. Okay? So... Um, no, you can ask a question about anything, and I will. Uh, so, 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 if I don't want to answer it, I'll just say that. <laughs> I'll talk to me afterwards. So, and, and we, we will get to the. Oh, that's why right, we can ask a diversionary question to slow me down. We will get to the end on time. Don't worry. I will just uh, start going. Uh, start skipping material if we need to. So, so don't worry about time. We'll get there. So, here is the one slide summary of what I want to say today. That over the over the next 10 years, I believe there's a, there's a big challenge that software people are going to face, um, and it's controlling effects. So by the end of this talk, I hope you'll understand exactly what I mean by that. Um, and that the, big, the big challenge in controlling effects is that we're going to move from an imperative by default programming model, which has served us extremely well for a long time, to a functional by default model. So this is, as it were, putting it rather starkly so I can fit it on one slide, but nevertheless, that's the theme that I want to, want to follow up. I want to, this is, this is on a fairly big scale, uh, right, sort of 10 year time scale. I, I think of the, the, the last 10 years, we've seen static type systems move from the laboratory into mainstream programming, and I think we'll see something similar happening with effects, right? So, and static type systems haven't dominated all of programming, but they've become adopted by the mainstream, and I think we'll see effect control systems of some kind adopted by the mainstream. So that's my overall, overall story. So here we are. The first thing that I need to do is to say a little bit about what I mean by an effect and what I, indeed I mean by a functional programming language. Now, I know some of you are experienced functional programmers, but Ulf told me not to assume that everybody knew uh, what even functional programming was. So here is, um, with apologies to the, the seasoned ones, a, a one-slide introduction. So over on the left-hand column is the programming languages that most of us grew up with, certainly I did, which are imperative programming languages. And they proceed by, uh, so here's a little computation in which I'm computing, uh, what is it, in one squared plus in two squared, the sum of the squares of two inputs. So over here I've got a sequence of assignments, I assign in one to x, then I multiply x by itself, and then I uh, add on the square of in two, and that's my result. Um, over here is a, uh, is a, a functional program now, this, this one is Excel, um, and here I'm computing exactly the same value, but it's, uh, it's spread out a bit over in space. Uh, and there's a kind of spectrum here between uh, these languages, which essentially allow you to do any kind of side effect anywhere, and over at this corner is the purely functional languages, which really don't allow you to do side effects at all. So let me just say a bit more then about what I mean about, about effects. So here's uh, just the imperative um, uh, programming paradigm. 
And uh, to, understand, to understand an imperative program, you need to have the notion of a program counter. Here it is, the yellow arrow, that says where the, where the program counter is. And you need to have a, no, a notion of mutable locations. Mutable meaning changeable memory locations. These are the red things. And so uh, after I execute the first statement, then uh, x1 gets the value of in1, so 3 appears in this box, x1. Then when I execute the next statement, oh, uh, x now contains 9, and then when I execute the next one, execute uh, contains 25. So you have a very important part of understanding the imperative programs, as we all kind of instinctively know, is the program counter and the flow of control. And many compilers spend a lot of time doing control flow analysis to figure out where control flow goes. And another, the other important thing is this right-hand column, is that x here is the name of a cell that contains a value. And the value contained in the cell can change over time. So if I ask you, what is the value of x, you can't answer me. You have to say, you can only say, what is the value of x when the program counter is here, and indeed when it has flowed through this particular sequence of, of previous values. Okay? So control flow very important, mutable locations very important. So in contrast, Functional languages work rather differently. So here's a spreadsheet, and here's the very same computation, but now each cell contains a computation which computes its value from something else. And I, don't, I can't really do an animation in the same sequence of steps kind of way at all. Indeed, there isn't a program counter. The sensible way to look at this spreadsheet is as a kind of data flow diagram in which in1 and in2 over here get multiplied, and that result lands up in the cell A2, and then those two cells get added, right? So the, the computation is, as it were, spread out in space rather than being spread out in time. That's, that's, a, that's a kind of... It's a different dimension in which the computation gets spread out in. And I can still write it down in textual form. Uh, a spreadsheet is one way to do it that's very appealing, because it's a, it has this kind of instant platform. But for building bigger programs, you, we don't know a better way than to write it out textually. But when we write it out textually, the order of these equations doesn't matter. They're just equations that say A2 is the name for a value. What value? It is the product of A1 and A1. Right? So... <coughs> Names name values rather than names naming locations, and that's a big difference. So the order of these equations doesn't matter, and I'm using an equal sign here rather than a colon equals, to, and which I mean, C would use an equal sign, but that's really really a mistake, right? Because it's not equal, is it? So, so I'm using a, 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 an equal sign here because I really do mean that A2 is equal to the product. Okay? So I hope this is all uh, very straightforward, so, but, but it's very different. You, you think in a different way. Right? You have to rewire your brain a bit. The interesting thing is that when you use a spreadsheet, you don't think of it as rewiring your brain. You just think, that's a spreadsheet. Of course that's how it works. Right? There's no notion of the program counter or which thing happens first. The computation is driven by the data dependencies, and how else could it possibly be? It's a very natural way to write programs. So spreadsheets are very um, uh, uh, friendly and small example, but I wanted to give you a slightly larger example to give you a kind of visceral feel, uh, feeling you know, in your guts for what writing a larger functional program might be. So this program is going to contain five lines of code. But I would like you to understand it, and I believe that you'll be able to understand this program even if you have not written any programs at all for, for the last 20 years. So, um, uh, so here it is. I, I was, this program is, was uh, given to me by a guy called John Harrop, who's become quite... Uh, uh, he's, he runs a consultancy in Cambridge. And uh, it's, uh, so the problem is... Uh, is um, to do with finding the atoms in a bunch of atoms that are uh, of distance n from a particular one. So here's a particular atom A, and I'm interested in finding how many, uh, which other atoms are exactly three atoms away from A. Now, I phrase this as atoms, but it could be a network, right? You're network guys, right? So think of this as a network. But, I, but uh, John told it me in the form of amorphous silicon. So this is, it turns out, a very important practical problem at scale. So you need to run this with, you know, 100,000 atoms or tens of millions of atoms. So pretty, fairly big. So, and the specification is that I want to find the atoms accessible in n hops, but no, no more than n, no, no fewer than n, exactly n hops. So there's no shorter path than n. So the, the, the uh, let's see, this is the one shell of atom A. That's the ones available in one hop from A. Yes, do you have a question? Yeah. No, oh, so, yeah, so the, these are not directional. Yeah. Yes. But, but, but uh, this guy is the one shell. So A, uh, the zero shell of A, the ones accessible in zero hops, is just A itself, right? But A is not part of its two shell, even though you could go hop, hop, right? Because the specification says the n shell of an atom A is the atom successful in n hops, but no fewer. Okay? So, 
So it's, when you have, uh, it's very important when looking at programs to understand what the specification is. So is everyone happy with the spec? <laughs> I haven't written it formally, but, uh, but it's only one line, so I'm satisfied with English. Okay, so here we are. So how, how are we to do this problem? Well, it's, it's um, uh, oh, beg your pardon, let me just, let me just do the, the two shells. So well, that shows, shows this up. So these blue guys now are two hops away. And um, even though this particular blue guy, you could get to him in three hops, one, two, three, but he's still part of the two shell because, oh, we can't take your pardon. Yes, you can, get, you can also get to him in two hops. That's right. Okay. It's the shortest one. Yeah. All right. So, uh, so here's the algorithm. So I'm going to write it out in kind of English first. So to find the n shell of an atom A, what do I do? If I could find the n minus 1 shell, right, then what have I got to do? Well, if I could find the, the immediate neighbors, that's the 1 shells, of all of those atoms, that would reach me out a little bit further from the n minus 1 to get to n, right? But to attack with Joe's point, it also would make me go back a bit towards my starting point. Right? But how far back could I possibly get? Right, so I could take the, the n minus 1 shell, take all their distance one neighbors and union all them up together, and then I've got to remove some things. What have I got to remove? Well, the n, the n minus 1 shell and the n minus 2 shell. I couldn't get any further back in just one point. Does that make sense? So that's my algorithm. And, uh, so now what I've got to do is to turn that into code. And, uh, oh, well, this is little, uh, I've just uh, explained the other thing. Algorithm. So here it is. Oh, dear. It's, uh, I, I lied. It's seven lines. <coughs> so let's just look at this book. And what does it do? So this first line uh, gives a type signature for the function, so it says what, what it does. So it takes three parameters, a graph that's going to be a description of the connectivity of this network or bunch of atoms, an int which says, an integer which says how many, uh, which shell I'm looking for, that's n, an atom which says which is the starting point, so it's going to be essentially one of the nodes of this graph, and I want to produce as a result a set of atoms, right, which is going to be the n shell of that particular atom in that particular graph. And how do I do it? Well, it's quite easy. I can do it by cases. If n is 0, so n shell applied to g0 and a, here are the three parameters lined up. In Haskell, this is a Haskell program, and we write function application using spaces, because function application is the most important thing that we do, and so we represent it by the quietest notation, namely a space. So here it is. Uh, uh, three parameters, uh, G0, if, so, so uh, an atom is its own zero shell, but I have to produce a set of atoms, so the zero shell of an atom A is just the singleton set containing A. And so here it is, unit set applied to A. In other languages you might write unit set open paren A close paren, but not in Haskell. So unit, unit set produces a singleton set. What about the one shell of A? Well, are they, the atoms that are just one away from A, well we have to consult the graph for that. So I'm assuming that there's some function neighbors, here's its type up here, that takes a graph and an atom and produces the immediate one-hot neighbors for the graph. Does that make sense? Right, so that's going to be part of what comes with the graph package, my, my specification of, the, um, of the, uh, this amorphous silicon stuff. So if I take G and A and I apply neighbors to it, then I get the set of, of atoms that are just one hop away from A, and that's what I wanted for the one shell. So now what do I do for the, um, the n shell? For, so for, that's dealt with the zero and the one cases. So the, uh, the last case to deal with is all the n's that are not zero and one. So it has to at least pattern matching goes top to bottom. So I know here that n is bigger than one. Well, I better be careful I don't call this with a negative number. But I, 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 I'll, I'll leave that. I'll ignore that for now. Let's suppose this is a, a positive integer. So what do we do? Well. Uh, let's see, I need to take the, um, the n shell, the, so the n minus 1 shell of, uh, of um, a, so here's the n minus 1 shell, I call it s1. So I call n shell with g and n minus 1, and that gives me the n minus 1 shell of a, and I call it s1. So now what do I need to do? For each atom in that set, so s1 is a set of atoms, and for each atom in that set, I must take what? I must take the immediate neighbors, and then I must union all of those things up. So here it is. I take, uh, I do a map union of the neighbor's function over S1. And here's the type of map union. It takes a set as its second argument, that's S1. And as its first argument, it takes, oh, a function. What's the function? Well, it's a function that it's going to apply to every member of this set. So, so map union is going to take this function, and it's going to apply it to every member of that second argument, each, each atom in that set. Um, 
And it takes, so you can see the types compatible, it takes a set of A's, and the function takes an A as its argument, it produces a set of something else. Well, uh, they can actually be anything, they can be, they can be B's. In fact, they go to the atoms again. So that's this neighbor's function. So this neighbor's of G function takes a single atom and produces its immediate neighbors. And then map union is going to take the union of all of those things so that in the end I get a set of B. That's the only hard bit in this program. Does that, does that make sense? Right. So, you, so, so ask a question at this point, because it, it's not going this, you, you, you're over the hump now. <laughs> okay. All right. So then once I've done that, I've uh, done this map union, then I've got to take away the n minus 1 shell and the n minus 2 shell, and they're both here, right? These are the, uh, these are the recursive proofs to n shell. So I hope that you can see that this, this program very directly reflects the algorithm that I, that I wrote here. Yeah. Oh, that's a good question. Why don't I remove the n minus 3 shells? Well, it's because, remember, S1, uh, where, where I started, is the, is the n minus 1 shell. So, so that means that I can get there in n hops, but no fewer. Right? If I take the immediate neighbors of them, oh, let's see. So uh, uh, let's see. So I take, uh, here we are. This is, the, this is the a's 3 shell, 1, 2, 3. This is a 3 shell. So I'm going to take the n minus 1 shell, that's its 2 shell. Oh dear, what happened? Oh, thank you, Um <laughs> I take the immediate neighbors of these three blue guys, and if they're immediate neighbors, that, so this is, all of these guys are the ones that I get from that map union. Now what have I got to delete? Well, I've got to delete um, these ones that are closer. But I couldn't, I didn't get this one, right? That would be the n minus 3 guy in your question, because I'm only moving one away from the three shell, I can't get, if I move just one back, I couldn't get any, any closer. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, there we are. Okay, good. So there we are, that's our program. Um, and, it, uh, and it even works. Um, and, uh, and just as with the spreadsheet stuff, I, the, the way to visualize it is to think of it as a, um, as a data flow diagram, not as a uh, program cantery thing. So here it is, just drawn out with, um, with boxes and arrows instead of uh, in textual form. So to make n shell of g, n, and a, assuming I'm taking this, uh, the, uh, the, the n bigger than um, one case, uh, what do I do? I take n shell of the n minus 1, and there's the n shell of the n minus 2 shell, I feed S1 into the map union of neighbors to get a set, and then I remove uh, the n minus 1 shell, and remove the n minus 2 shell, and then the result flows out the top. So it's just the same as the spreadsheet, really, dressed up in uh, an ASCII um, um, uh, typewriter font rather than um, pictures. Okay? So, what's the message of all this? Just that this idea of writing spreadsheet like the purely functional program scales to, to building real problems. But you might worry about this program because it looks as if it's expensive. So I hope that maybe some of you who are ahead of me have been thinking, this may not be a very good algorithm. Right? Any, 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 any ideas about why it might be an extremely bad way to compute n shells? Um, there's a clue on this slide. When I say bad, I mean, it'll give the right answer, but it will take the lifetime of the known universe to get the right answer. Uh, yeah. Exponentially Yeah, right. It's, it's extremely expensive because it makes too many calls. So to compute n shell of n, I've got to compute uh, the n minus 1 shell and the n minus 2 shell. But look at what happens. To compute the n minus 1 shell, I need to compute the n minus 2 shell and the n minus 3 shell. And to compute the n minus 2 shell, I need to compute the n minus 3 and the n minus 4. And look, here are two duplicate calls to the n minus 2 shell, right? So making duplicate calls is really bad. But, but, but this is okay, we can fix this. Well, why can we fix it? Well, we can fix it because n shell is a function. What do I mean by that? If you give it the same inputs, it produces the same outputs. So we've all been remorselessly trained by uh, C and Visual Basic and so forth to, to think of a function as something that can do something other than take some inputs and produce some outputs. But go back to high school mathematics. The sine function takes an input and produces an output, and if you give it the same input to the sine function, it has better produced the same output. Right? Mathematicians would be extremely disappointed if sine of pi gave zero one day and you know, one the next day. Right? It always gives the same answer, so same input, same output. And you remember nothing else about functional programming. This is the story. Right? This is, you'll see this written in lots of ways. Purity, referential transparency, no side effects. This is what it means. 
It's like uh, my same inputs, same output. So this n shell thing, right? If I give it the same g n and a, it always produces the same output. So in particular, I can be confident as a you know almost as a, a, a even a compiler to a program transformation that the two calls to uh, n shell n minus two here give me the same answer, and so I can common them up. Now you might say, how can I common them up? Because they're not actually physically apparent in this program. If I'd written out n shell of n minus two twice, then I could common them up easily. Well, it turns out there are lots of ways to, to do this. You can use memo functions, one, one sort of automated way to do it, or you can transform the program a bit to return a pair of results. And I'm going to spare you the details of that because I think I've, I've told you enough. I just wanted to get the idea that you can take a, a program that, um, uh, that's obviously correct and transform it into one that's uh, uh, markedly more efficient and still correct because you, you've relied on these purely functional properties. Okay? Yeah? So it's like when actually. Oh, yeah, yeah, exactly. So this is just Fibonacci with this guy. Yeah, same thing. Yes, but it's an inefficient Fibonacci, but it's an interesting, Fibonacci is designed to, uh, to be inefficient, as it were, whereas this is, this is, this is a real problem. So, but it's the same idea, yes. Okay, so, um, so the, the, the message I want to get here is this idea of, of programming with pure functions is, um, uh, has, has benefits for programming. And I want to uh, run down a, a quick list of what I think we get from writing pure programs. By pure programs, I mean this. Same inputs, same outputs. That's what I mean when I say purity. Um, and uh, so, here, so here are some things that I think you get from purity. First thing, programs become easier to understand and reason about. So here's a, here's a program that you might see in a, in a Java-like language or C-sharp. Here's a x1 and x2 here are meant to be cubes or something like that. So I insert something into x1 and I delete something from the same thing from x2. Now what can I say about uh, what's happened here? Well, um, you know, so can I, put, can I put these two calls in the opposite order, for example? Uh, it's a little hard to tell because it depends a bit what happens behind the scenes. Could I, well, what would happen if x1 and x2 were actually the same cube? Then, of course, if I put y in and then delete it again, that's, that's a no-off. Right? Whereas if I put them the other way around and they were the same cube, then uh, something different would happen. Whereas if they're different cubes, you probably could swap them. So you need to be careful when you're, when you're dealing with mutable state about when two uh, pointers are the same and when they're different. Right? And that's very different from in a functional story when a value simply is a value. Um, so, uh, and you might also wonder, is what does x1, what does insert and delete do uh, behind the scenes, right? It might uh, alter some state, or print something, or log something, or, or even just do something entirely unrelated that the programmer wrote inside that method. You can't really tell from the outside. So it's not impossible to reason about programs like this. People do it all the time. That's what most of our programs look like. It's even possible to do it using static analyses and compiler transformations, and people have done heroic work on analyzing imperative programs. But it's, it's difficult to do, and it's difficult to do because the side effects are hidden. And so this applies both for compilers and for people. Um, now, there's, there's good reasons for the side effects, right? So it, it's, it's a very appealing program model in many ways. But I just want to point out that it, that it has its costs uh, that we perhaps don't recognize so much. So here's a, a, um, a kind of closely related point. I talked about understanding. Now, there's, uh, the next step beyond understanding is to say, I'd like to formally verify in some ways some properties of this program. So here is a, a fragment of um, spec sharp, which is a um, specification language, uh, a, a kind of extension of C sharp. Uh, and uh, JML is a very similar language. So in the, the idea is that on any method, you can add requires and ensures clauses that are like pre and post conditions um, that the function should obey. Now, what's this thing? Requires, so here's a Boolean valued expression. Uh, and then this ensures thing uh, says, well, oh, there's this funny thing for all. So that's, that's already something that doesn't really appear in the, in the main language. And then there's this old thing, because we have to say the old value of this of i is equal to the new value of this and i. So, so it's, it's a, there's a slightly funny language going on in here. But, um, uh, and, and these pre and post conditions are what? They're written in some language. And what language is it? Well, it kind of looks like Java, or it looks like C sharp. But actually, it's a very carefully chosen sub-language that is, well, functional, actually. Right? And why is it functional? Well, because that's the high-level language that we know for writing specifications. So a rather facile point is, well, if that's the high-level language we know for writing specifications, why don't we just write our programs that way? Um, but nevertheless, it is interesting that specifications tend to be written in, a functional, in functional languages because that's the, way, that's the way mathematics and theory proofs work. The, um, the other, other complications arise from side effects. So this old thing all arises because of side effects. Right? Uh, 
The uh, other complications that arise from side effects is in spec sharp and J and L, so forth, you can write object invariants that are things that are meant to be true about the object. But they're true when the method is called, and they're true when the method finishes, perhaps. But they're not necessarily true in the method, in the middle of the method, because in the middle of the method, you screw around with the values inside <laughs> the object, and in the middle of that, the invariant doesn't hold. But you don't want the, uh, the uh, verification system to say your program's wrong. So what do you do? So you have additional complications to do with exposed statements to say when you're allowed to look at the invariant. So again, all this can be done. Spec Sharp's a very wonderful system, you know, built by colleagues of mine. I have to be nice about them. Um, but they're sort of struggling with a, with a, a difficult medium. Oh, right. you know, I haven't asked any questions recently. This is a bad sign. <laughs> How are we doing? So I think I'm continue to encourage you. Don't, 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 be, uh, don't uh, let me uh, run away with you. So verification is one thing you might want to do as a program. And testing is uh, another thing you might want to do as a program. And we're going to hear a lot more about that this afternoon from John. But I'm just going to give you the, the one slide story about this. So here's, oh, here's what John will show you how to do. You can, uh, here's a property of sets. We talked about sets of atoms. Supposing you were trying to say, what property do my sets package or, or module have? Well, it should be the case that S union S is equal to S. So in, uh, in Haskell, you could write that as a function like this. Prop union takes a set of A and delivers a bool. So prop union is a funny function. It takes a set, and it should always return the result true. All right? So it's a bit of a funny function, because you know what the answer will be whenever you call it. But it expresses, in the language itself, not in some other language, in the language itself, it expresses the idea that Union of S and S should be the same as S for every S. Right? For every is because this prop union takes a function. So now what you need, if you can, now you can imagine having a, a, a package, and that's what John's going to tell you about, that tests prop union, gives it lots of sets, and runs it lots of times to see whether it does always give the answer true. Now, this is really easy in this functional stuff. You just give it, you, you invent S's, and you give it to prop union, and you see if it gives you that true. Contrast what you have to do in a, a, in a, a language of mutable state, right? So in a, in a language of mutable state, before you can test the method, you have to set up the state of the world before you call it. You call the object, you must then inspect the state of the world, because the results that you get back may not be the point of calling the method. The method might be void something, in which case the reason for calling it is to mutate the state some, somewhere in the world. So you've got to inspect the state somehow, and you may have had to capture previous values of the state in order to, like this, this old stuff, right, we have to capture it. Here, we didn't have to capture the old value of S, right, when we union S with itself, that didn't change S, S stands for the original set all the time. So, you know, what could be simpler than to say this, there's no, there's no holding involved. Union SS is simply a new value, okay? So, you start to think in a different kind of way about the whole thing. Maintenance, let me say a little bit about I'm, I build, uh, build, run this compiler for uh, Haskell, as Paul said, and uh, it's, oh, I don't know, 100,000 lines of Haskell, so it's pretty small by your standards. Uh, but nevertheless, it seems quite big to me, and, and it worries me when I make a change. I think, if I make a change here, can, will I be, can I guarantee to propagate it to all the places that it's needed? So uh, one of the good things about purity is that it forces everything that a function does to be exposed in its type. So a function, rather than having type void to void, has a more informative type, which says all its arguments and all its results, and you know it doesn't do anything else. So, as it were, it wears its heart on its sleeve. You can, you can see all its interfaces. So if you change what it does, you probably have to change its type. When you change its type, your, the type checker will tell you if any call sites are now incompatible with that. It's not bulletproof. You might still have type int to int, but do something different, and the type checker won't help you there. But it's incredibly effective in practice. The, the, uh, the, uh, what happens uh, typically is you change the representation of a type, you just, and then I, I often don't do anything further, I just run the compiler, and that tells me the first things that I need to change. And I keep compiling and fixing until it, until it uh, gets past the compiler, and then it works. And it's quite a common uh, uh, programming pattern. Just a little bit on the side, this, 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 uh, this type tells you even more than you might think. This reverse takes a list of things and returns a list of things. But it takes a list of anything. This is really for all A, list of A to list of A. What does that tell you? Oh, that tells you that reverse doesn't mess with the elements of the list. Because it says, well, because if it works for any type, it means it can't add one to every element of the list. Because it that reverse doesn't know that the list consists of integers. 
it can't uh, insert if, if the elements were arrays. It couldn't add an element to the array. It couldn't, it, because reverse knows nothing about the element types. So there's a kind of, kind of way in which the type can tell, tell you about the things that the function can't do as well as the things that it can do. And that's very powerful as well. So I'm not going to rant very much about static typing. And uh, I'm, I'm a, a big believer in static typing. I know there are good things about dynamic typing. But the, the, the main point I'm wanting to get here is that purity forces you to expose in the type of things, if you're into static typing, everything that the, the, the function does. Not everything, but a lot of what the function does, more than if you're uh, um, okay. Last thing is performance. Now, so, uh, uh, so the execution model for a functional language is a um, somewhat more abstract in a way than our imperative model. The reason we've grown up with our imperative model is it's very close to what von Neumann machines do. After all, real machines do have program counters. Right? So we have this very intuitive uh, gut feel for the way our programs are executed. And the compiler doesn't have to cross a very large uh, abstraction gap to convert your program, which has a program counter, into the machine code, which has a program counter. The, the, the gap is, is smaller. So functional languages have a larger gap to cross. And that means that um, execution may, uh, you know, it, it, it may run more slowly, or, or even less predictably. This, this is, um, uh, you know, not, not everything is wonderful. And one of the things that we worry about a lot is the uh, speed and, and predictability of that performance. So this has improved a lot over time. But the big point I want to make here is not that Compilers have got better, which they have. You know, so if you look at the, uh, you know, some of these micro benchmark shootout programs, you'll see that Haskell is right up there. Um, but uh, much more importantly, I'd, I'd like to say that there's a constant factor to do with, with compilation speeds, but there's an asymptotic factor that's to do with your own brain. How many brain cycles do you have to devote to your program? If you can spare more of them to think about the algorithm, you may be able to make an algorithm that's simply asymptotically faster than if you don't have those brain cycles. So I'd like to free human cycles for doing things that really only humans can do. The other thing is that purity supports a kind of, even at the compiler level, it supports a kind of radical optimization technique. So one of the reasons I chose the n shell example is because John Howe had this very same program, program in C++, and he, and he um, converted it into, uh, I think it was OCaml or F sharp initially, and, uh, and then he found in the end that it ran 100 times faster. That's weird. And this wasn't to do with the, the exponential thing. That was all done in the C++ one. Why was it? It was because in C++, when you union two sets, since the sets contain mutable values, and the sets themselves are mutable, you must copy the entire set to produce a new set. right? Because the old sets might be mutated by some other program. right? So, if you, um, so the, the set union algorithm in C++ was conservative in the sense that it made a copy of the set. Now, since the sets are in, in, uh, in OCaml and, and, and F sharp were immutable, they, the, the union set contained a lot of sharing with the, the previous, the, the, uh, if you take the union of S1 and S2, the union data structure shared lots of substructure with the original S1 and S2. Do, does that make sense? Since it can't change, they're just values. It's like saying, well, uh, uni 3 and, and, and uni 3, you can both point to the same 3 because it's just 3, right? It's not going to change. It's, if it was a location containing 3, it would be a different deal. And as another completely different kind of example, think of a SQL query optimizer. So SQL, at least without updates, is a, uh, is a functional language, and X query is 2. And the query optimizers for SQL and so forth do radical program transformations and to, to produce humongously faster programs than if you just ran the original. Right? But it all relies on the absence of side effects. This last one is another uh, real life <coughs> example of, of, a, of a larger scale that John, uh, the same John Howard uh, told me about. Um, he, he had, I, I chose it again because there's a direct comparison, he had a 200,000 line C uh, vector graphics program, which he ended up recoding in, in OCaml, into, it turned out to be a quarter of the size. And to his amazement, it ran five times faster. That's weird. I think this is, to be fair, I think this is to do with real-time performance and the way that destructors cascade. So that the, you got much better real-time performance, less, less stop, let, there was less pausing while the C++ destructors ran all at one moment. So uh, with all of these things, you should take them with a pinch of salt. Right? These, are, these are indicative things, not real data. But nevertheless, the message that I want to get across to about this is that purity has its, has its cost in terms of abstraction, but it also has real performance benefits. I think when I started exploiting it. One of the. Uh, um, Just to be certain, yeah. 
Well, so, so that's I right. Mean, so, I, just in certain cases. I mean, they are, they are suitable for many types uh, of infrastructure, but not others. I mean, uh, right. So, so yes. So, so some. If you, if you have a very large mm -hmm. state for this, very large, right. but you're going to do just a little bit of modification, mm -hmm. then then you basically, in a functional declarative language, you have to create the whole structure more or less. So I, want, so I want to get to this. So this is this is to do with um, can you get away with writing every program with no state at all, right? And so and in the end, no, you can't, right? Yes. Um, and so so uh, the, the what, what I, so the, my story is not um, functional for everything, but functional by default. I'd like the our default programming method of to be a functional one, right? And where you have to do something there for well chosen reasons. Then yes. So, so thank, thank you for that because, I, because I'm I'm not trying to take a you know a completely purist position here. That was indeed where we started with purely functional programming and slowly being dragged into the real world. I'll say a little bit more about that in a second. Okay, good. So last thing about performance then is, is to do with parallelism. So this is very flavour of the month, right? We're all uh, worried about multi-cores and so forth. And so you know, I really only want to make some some um, outline-y kind of remarks, which is just to say that. Uh, uh, something you get with purity is you get this kind of by default parallelism. It's not necessarily easy to exploit, but it gives you a good starting point. So here is, if there's no mutable state and, and, uh, in your program, then you don't get any locks and waste hazards. This, this little data flow diagram gives the same result every time you run it, whether you run it on one processor or 100 processors. There's something kind of inherently parallel about it, and that's very attractive. Now, when I say it's hard to exploit, we knew this in the 1980s and tried quite hard to um, persuade multiprocessors to run functional programs in parallel in the 80s. And that was turned out to be difficult because uh, the uniprocessors kept getting faster too quickly. So by the time we built our multiprocessors, you know, the Z80 would go faster than our wonderful hand-built machine. But that's, that's not really the case anymore. And uh, you can see some larger scale examples of this kind of parallelism that really do work. So um, MapReduce, is a um, very well-known example of a big data parallel algorithm. And map and reduce are functions, right? And the whole thing relies on the not having side effects between different little bits happening in that reduce tree. Um, SQL running in parallel on clusters of machine, same story. And have you heard of language integrated queries? This is, uh, you know, this is a um, Microsoft C-sharp kind of thing, but drawing very heavily on functional ideas. Um, and Helix is the parallel version on it. Again, it relies on parallelism, and here's why. So here's an example of a link query. This is a sort of uh, data-intensive kind of thing. What happens? So, so here's a thing that looks a little bit like uh, SQL, doesn't it? Uh, from C in customers, where, and there's some predicate, select C, and then convert that to a list, and that's going to be bound to this value, top 10. So the idea is to find the top 10 customers um, in this, uh, uh, in this uh, relation. Now, what's happening here? Index, so this predicate here, oh, this is funny. Right, because usually predicates are things like, you know, is the customer's age bigger than 30? That's a pure function. This one isn't pure. It increments the value of index. Index is a mutable cell. So what the programmer was trying to do here is to say, every time you pick a customer, add one to index. And when it gets to the 10, stop adding them. Right? That's the intent of this. But it doesn't really work very well, does it? You can see that in a, in a where clause of a, of a SQL-like thing, having side effects like a bumping this index counter isn't going to work very well, especially in a parallel setting. Right? Because um, if you try to parallelize this query, you may get race hazards on this guy. Um, and uh, and it, indeed, it may not be very obvious whether you have got something side effect. If you call a function in here, it's not obvious to see whether there is a side effect inside it. So in fact, P-Link, uh, this, this uh, parallel implementation of link simply says, in a rather informal way, don't use side effects inside um, p-link queries, without really saying what they are, and certainly without any static checks to make sure that you haven't. Otherwise, you simply get unpredictable behavior. So, what's the point here? Just that purity, you know, 100% purity, is essential for the, the kind of uh, link and SQL query optimizers to work on. And we accept that in these kind of limited domains, and really maybe we should think about uh, sort of broadening the domains in which we try to do that stuff. So here's my big picture, my right? overall picture about what I think is going on in the world at the moment. Uh, so I've used this on, on uh, several occasions before, but I like it because it has a, it's a, it's a diagram with blobs, and that makes it um, feel comfortable. So here are, here are language, language's usefulness. So useless at the bottom and useful at the top. 
And here is, this, uh, this axis is really effect. Dangerous means effects anywhere, and safe means, uh, well, no effects, or very, very limited effects. So we started off with uh, you know, assembly programming, and C programming, and then Java, and C++, and so forth, and that's uh, arbitrary effects, very useful, but dangerous. And incrementally, I think we're, um, lots of people are thinking about how to move these languages in a direction that helps to control effects. This is actually just one example, right? Formally or informally, we're moving in this direction. Meanwhile, the House Haskell guys started down here with very, 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 very safe language, but uh, uh, sadly, useless. <laughs> because uh, you know, if you don't have any side effects, well, all that happens is your computer gets hot, right? <laughs> you can't even print anything, that's a side effect. So plan B is to try to you know, start from this. The good thing about being a researcher is you're allowed to start here. Whereas you guys are not allowed even to start here. You, you have, you have, anyway, we start here and we, we, we've learned how to, how to make things better. So I just want to say a little bit more then about what's going on. So the, the plan A version is to um, move in this direction. And Erlang is a, is a nice example of this. So Erlang restricts effects, right? It says uh, we, we're not going to have mutable variables at all. But we will have effects, right? So these... Uh, functional programs can have the effect of sending and receiving messages. Those are side effects, all right. Um, and we can do input, output, and exceptions are also a kind of effect. But Erlang provides a very rich, pure sub-language with lists, tuples, higher order functions, conventions, and all that kind of stuff, right? So as to encourage, sort of lure you into writing a lot of your program in this functional stuff and using this effect stuff when you need to. Right? So it's, it's part of the, you know, do it, do it when you need. So Erlang is a, is a really nice example of that. And uh, uh, F-sharp is another one that um, Don, my colleague Don Simon has been working on. So F-sharp is a functional language for .NET. You meant so functional language sounds functional, but of course F-sharp is not really functional in the, in the sort of formal, you know, like the sign function is functional at all, because it's a .NET language. And so you can call any .NET procedure, method, anywhere, and that means that any F-sharp function can have an arbitrary effect at any time, so it's less pure than other, actually. Um, but, F sharp provides a rich, pure sublanguage with lists, tuples, comprehensions, high order functions, and so forth. And that again encourages you to write in that language and only explore the, the side effecting world when you have to. So, um, and, uh, the, the, so, so that's this sort of plan A direction. But the difficulty with plan A is this question How do we know when a function is, sure, is pure for sure? Right? How can we be certain that the function is pure? Well, you can look at it, but it calls something else. Right? Hmm? I, I said you could look transitively all the way down yeah. um, can, and check, right? So you might hope that. You can add iterations to yeah. Uh, uh, right. You can, you can, so you can look all the way down, but, but the, 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 the one difficulty with this is that the fabric of computation is imperative, right? Every computation in these, not, well, not in F sharp and other, but every computation in C sharp is an imperative thing, right? So you look anywhere, you see side effects. Right? But of course, that most of them are encapsulated within an object. You have to argue about ownership types and so forth. So, so it's quite hard in the conventional world right, to figure this stuff out for sure. And that, I think that's the challenge for plan A. I, I think it you know, may be a mutable challenge, but it's a research question at the moment. So plan B, uh, our, our Haskell guys, and, 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 and the sort of pure functional scheme is a similar language, right? Uh, well, they have side effects, I suppose. Haskell is really the only language that has completely adopted the, uh, the uh, pure mantra, right? So it's got a rich, pure language, not a rich, pure uh, sub-language, right? It's a rich, pure language with no side effects at all. But the trouble is that we don't just want to make our computers hot. So we spent a long time being quite embarrassed about this, really, that really all our programs could do was take a string and produce a string. We allowed them to have one side effect at the top, which is to print the result string. Um, but uh, then we learn how to do I.O. using these monad things. So I'm not really going to tell you what monads are, just to, just to try to give the idea that uh, a pure function like two upper, which is, uh, turns them into an upper case, takes a string and produces a string. And from its type, you can tell that it's pure. It does nothing but take a string and produce a string. This function, get user input, takes a string which it prints as a prompt and returns a string. But this I.O. thing here, string to I.O. string, says in the type, that get user input might have arbitrary input output effects. So the, the effects are marked in the type. Um, and so, in fact, the way that the program works is your program consists of a mix of effectful and pure code, but that rather than being sort of, uh, you know, if you put a spoonful of sewage into a vat of wine, what do you have? A vat of sewage, right? 
But the, the, uh, the, uh, the type system with this monad stuff keeps, it's like a sort of plastic seal that keeps the, uh, the dirty I.O. stuff separate from the pure stuff. Now, actually, I say, I'm, I'm being pejorative here. There's nothing wrong with this. You have to do it. That's what the program is there to do, is to do the I.O. You know? It's to connect the call, send the message, write the file. So this is what, every, this is what the program is ultimately there to do, supported by the green stuff. Yeah. The problem with this is basically you are still arbitrarily mixing the side effects. Oh, I, the am I arbitrarily mixing them? Yes. Mm. Compared to Alan, for example, where you only encapsulate the functional part within the notion of a process. And then you know that the functional part is within this notion of a process. Everything mm. else is, is somehow... So I think this is a conversation without Trevor and copying us. I'm not quite sure what you're saying. I just want, I just want to... The, uh, the, 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 really, the only message of... You have an arbitrary way to mix... Yeah. Even, even you say this is, yeah. this is a side effect. But the arbitrary way to, to mix yeah. and mix... Yeah. So, so... And, and, I got one way to send the message. Boop. You know, that's it. From when the message is coming to when it goes out, you're in So I'm not trying to say that this is necessarily the only way to do things. I'm just trying to say that, that, uh, that, I, that I believe that, uh, that I mean, I'm using Haskell as a source of illustrations because that's the research community I come from. But my, my sort of the, the big message is that I think that you know, languages of the future are going to consist of carefully chosen mixtures of uh, large chunks of pure stuff and smaller chunks of impure stuff with some way to keep them separate. And I think that way will be statically checkable in some form. Right now. I, I doubt you. If I become a bit more anodyne and nuanced like that, you'll probably be happy. But I, I, I yeah. I think kind of checking if it's boundary is the important thing. Yeah, yeah. You want, you want to know where the boundary is? Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say that the way you've drawn the diagram, you know, the, the the graph there is very important. But you don't arbitrarily generate side effects in some degree. Yeah. Only, so you have to have. Yeah, yeah. There are no little isolated yellow blobs inside here. Actually, even that's not quite true. You can have internally inside a pure algorithm, you might have a stateful algorithm whose outputs are all purely functional. But, but that's another choice. The, 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 the one that really does side effect on the outside, you can't. No, no, that's right. If it does a bank on the outside, it's got to be sort of connected yeah. somehow. Yes, that's right. No little, no little oil droplets floating about inside. Yeah, so that's which is what I think. Good point, surely. There are real side effects. I mean, and there are incidental side effects. Yeah. The incidental side effects right. are like what you call it, trade safety versus in job. You know, yeah. really want to become an empowered. Right. That's, that's an incidental. Yes. Thing. And then you've got real things like, oh, hang on, you know, we are in the real world. You yes. Know, photons are coming at me and they get destroyed. That's real. You can never expect away from it. Right. So that's exactly it. Yeah, and you need that kid. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I want and really what I'd like to do. The incidental side effects, the side effects you decide as incidental, described as incidental, are to do with really the way that our, our conventional languages um, uh, work, right there. And, and if, we, we, if we maybe wrote them and built them a bit differently, we could concentrate on the important ones. So I do, I'm being told five minutes, but actually we, we, we're finishing, this session finishes at quarter two, or is it 22? 22. Right, so we've got 10 minutes, including, include, as I, I, I want to, what do I want to say? I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip this bit. I just wanted, I wanted to say a little bit about. Um, that these, these two plans are not mutually exclusive. And one very nice um, piece of work that happened, happened recently was a bit of cross-fertilization. We took, uh, took transactional memory out of a plan A language, plugged it into Haskell, uh, had some new ideas, and sent it back into the plan B language. So I'm going to skip transactional memory, I think. Because interesting, though it is, but I think it's a, a wonderful thing. But um, we missed uh, the, 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 the thing that I wanted to... That I, want, I want to make one very quick point about transactional memory is that I, so far I've been talking about effects as being either any effect or no effects. Right? But matters are more nuanced than that. For transactions, you want to have a kind of in-between effect, which says inside a transaction, I'm sorry I'm not going to have time to tell you exactly what they are, inside a transaction, you can mutate transa transacted variables, but you cannot do any input-output. So you can do some effects, but not all. And it turns out that being able to say that and have that statically checked is really, really helpful for making transactional work nicely. Okay? And that shows up in Haskell in the, in the type. So something which can do arbitrary I.O. effects has an I.O. type. Something which can do this limited class of effects has an S.T.M. type. So again, shows up in the type. Okay, so here's my um, uh, overall claim then that, that uh, there's, there's too much of this incidental stuff. So this is really your slide, Joe. Right, this for loop, which is, what does it do? It adds up the numbers between 1 and n. 
And it has loads of incidental effects, assigning to T, assigning to I, incrementing I, assigning to T here. None of these are to do with, with uh, sending messages to the real world. Right? This is all incidental, and we shouldn't do that in our fabric of our computation. The fabric of computation should be functional, and we should do I.O. where we absolutely have to. All right. Now, so uh, very, very quickly, I just wanted to, to um, sort of reflect a bit on, on where we are um, in all of this. So functional programming stuff has been fascinating academics for a long time, but now it's actually started to uh, get into the, into the real world. And, and interest has really uh, skyrocketed. The very fact that we're here today is, in, in, is, is, uh, really would not have happened three years ago at all. So suddenly, the sort of functional programming stuff is kind of cool, as it used to be nerdy. This is great. I, uh, no, I'm just so used to being thought of as a nerdy person. It's rather nice to be. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what happens to most research languages. Right? So if you're a researcher, you make a new language. It has one user and dies up to one year. <laughs> a successful research project goes like this. It has one user. It goes up to sort of 50 or so, and it dies after five years. That's really successful research project. This is what happens to Java and Perl and Ruby. Uh, they uh, cross this threshold of immortality, uh, after which they cannot be allowed to die, no matter how often they are. So, um, strangely, though, this is what's happened to Haskell. Right? So, so again, I'm choosing Haskell not because it's better than any other language, but because it's just the one I know. So it's a good, good a better source of examples. So we were, had a sort of long plateau period, having started in, back in 1990. And just recently, it's taken a, a, a distinct uptick, quite a big uptick, and the, my, I got this quote from a blog, I rather like this. Learning Haskell is a great way of training yourself to think functionally so you're ready for C sharp 3.0. <laughs> hey, if it works, you know, if it works, I, I think this guy will never use C sharp 3.0, right? But, but I'm happy for that to be his motivation. And that's also indicative. I, don't, I can't really explain why it's, why it's happened. It's um, I can, what, what are they doing? I've got, so I, I, in fact, sent um, a message to the Haskell mailing list asking for examples of what people were doing. They're doing all kinds of things. Um, uh, and, and these are all people who are building real applications out in, out in companies. And I know that and that's happening in, in lots of other languages, too. So Erlang is, uh, you know, so you may not know this, uh, all of you, but Ericsson is widely respected, at least by, by my community, you know, as a shining example of doing the right thing. But, but 15 or 10 or 15 years ago, you know? <laughs> It's, um, uh, Microsoft has decided to commercialize F-sharp, which I'm very happy about. There's these, these other, OCaml and Scala and Schema, uh, used to be very academic languages, but are becoming very widely used in the industry. And mo almost most interesting of all, languages like C-sharp and Java and Python are beginning to adopt functional ideas. And they're beginning to do so in, a, in an explicit way. It used to be implicit. You know, they came with new names. And now, Anders Hel 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 Helsberg stands up and says, I got this from Eric Meyer, which is great. So Link is a good example of something that was very uh, functionally inspired. So this is all kind of, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just making um, sort of uh, general remarks here, but I thought I'd try to give you some data to say, you know, has this, is this uptick really happening? So again, the data that I have most convenient access to is, is related to Haskell. So here are just some graphs. This is GHC's bug tracker, my compiler, over the last eight years. So this is the, the rate of um, uh, uh, tickets, you know, bugs or feature requests per day. And you'll see this is rising fairly sharply at the moment. Now, you may take this as an indication that GHC is becoming much more unreliable. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I like to think of it that uh, it probably means that more people are uh, exploring more dark corners of it. Um, this is the Haskell IRC channel over the last six years, um, that, uh, the Internet Relay chat channel, and it's going up very sharply as well. And strangely enough, this is, so this is from the Haskell... Um, uh, uh, Haskell.org website. There's lots of user groups have started in the last 12 months. This is this is just this January and February for all these user groups meeting. It was quite quite extraordinary. Zero minutes. Sorry, so my question is, can this also be due to like, the Haskell development is happening within Microsoft? This is not just Haskell, right? So it's not just I'm using Haskell as my source of examples, but I believe no. that this trend but I mean, the is strongly company, across. Uh, I think, so occasionally people say, yes, the reason my boss allowed me to come to this conference is because uh, Haskell has been developed by Microsoft. And, and so I smile and say, little do you know that Microsoft, you know, happens to be funding me rather than, you know, I'm doing, doing Haskell. Haskell is not, sorry, Microsoft is not saying uh, Haskell is the future for the company. Other people may think that, and I would like that to be the case, but, uh, <laughs> but it's a kind of one-man show. Last thing uh, on, on my zero minutes. I do want to tell you, just, just uh, uh, take the opportunity for an, 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 an investment here to the, and, and also to give you some more data. 
Commercial users of functional programming is a um, workshop started actually by um, John Locke and Kathleen Fisher some, uh, in 2004 when it had 20 participants. Uh, the next year it had uh, 20, and the next year it had 40, and the next year it had 107. This is, uh, this is last year. And uh, uh, so I'm, I'm co-chairing COP 2008. So this is, this is people describing that all the speakers are from industry. It's not a referee conference. It's a developer-organized conference. And uh, I think this curve is also telling us something. We've, com we've completely exceeded our, our wildest expectations. And in fact, so much so that we turned uh, the uh, uh, academic uh, international conference on functional programming now has a, a kind of attached developer conference for the first time this year, of which CUFP will be a part, but we'll also have tutorials and demos and recruitment and all that kind of stuff. So somehow, something is happening. I can't tell you what, exactly what it is, but something, something is happening that says functional programming is becoming important. So here we are. The languages and tools are becoming more widely used. The ideas, most important, the ideas are becoming mainstream, right? They're perhaps through, through other languages. And control of effects is the big, big deal. Um, that's, that's my main message. I did, um, uh, I'll, I'll leave you while we're, we're um, finishing with these uh, quotes I got from various people when I sent out my message to say, tell me your examples. Um, I just uh, snipped some of these, you can just read them. But my, 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 one of my favorites is this, C isn't hard, Programming in C is hard. <laughs> Sorry, that's why. On the other hand, Haskell is hard, but programming in Haskell is <laughs> easy. So there you go. Any, any, has anybody got other questions? Yeah. Uh, well, listening through your presentation, I still keep thinking about the same question I still have an answer. Uh, why do I need a new language? I mean, oh. I can do all this in C, including sampling, and what is up by using sampling, interesting, oh. passing, argument by value. So that's a good question. Why do I need a new language? So I guess it's, uh, this is the, this, the, the thing is that in C, the fabric of computation, the very computational metaphor is inherently to do with side effects. So if I'm to be sure that a piece of, piece of code is pure, I have to do quite sophisticated reasoning. Right? So you may write, you may write by convention in a functional style in C. Right? It's, it's, uh, and it, but it, first, it's hard to be sure that you're doing it. Be absolutely sure that you've done it right. And the second is that, you, that C doesn't provide you with good support for uh, freewheeling allocation of data structures and first class functions. So you can have the function pointer, but if you want to build a function that captures free variables, it's more difficult. So it can be done, it can certainly be done, um, but it's, uh, you know, if you're going to use that metaphor, you might as well use a language that's designed for it. But uh, isn't it still true that the So the question is, isn't it true that C is most suitable for the processes that we have because it maps directly to assembler? Very true. Now, um, so, so why not write an assembler? That's really suitable for the processes we have, right? So it's the business of compilers and compiler writers to connect my sophisticated thoughts about the program I want to write to the processor. Processors are cheap. They let them execute it, right? If they execute it for more instructions, I don't care. My heart does not bleed for the x86 processor in my laptop, right? I don't care if it executes a few more instructions. I do care about my brain cycles. Yeah. But is it so that the, still the processors are, are behaving in the same way of imperative programming, as uh, Andres was saying? Like, uh, is it still following the programming line by line? Oh, the, the processor will do that, yeah. right? But what has happened is that by programming in, in your functional language, you, you've You've hidden the fact that the processor does it. So the, the implementation will do it, but your program can never observe that that's happening. Right? So in fact, you know, initially people thought functional languages, oh, we'll design new kinds of processors for them. Right? But it turned out that today's processors, the kind of von Neumann style processors, are still the most efficient way you know, of executing those functional programs. Can you make a comment, John? Yeah, actually, yeah. I don't believe that processors work that way anymore. It's a, it's a fiction. I mean, the first thing that a processor does when it gets the stream of assembly code is tries to figure out how to get rid of all the side effects so that it can do everything internally in parallel anyway. Right. So it's actually the assembly code interface. Uh, to, to think that you can actually be sure of how the processor is behaving just by looking at the assembly code, particularly when you start to take cache coherency into account, I mean, it, it just becomes incredibly complex. Um, and now that we've got multi-core systems, I mean, we really have for all practical purposes, moved away from von Neumann architecture. I, I see one, one thing that is 
team from functional language is very important. It's two things. Like, of course, the type, because the types are being developed within the functional language. But the other thing is that not everything is first class value. This uh -huh. is very important for our scale applications. For here to change things, to send modules as first class and everything. And this is an important point of function that came from the functional program. Yes, and you could have put, uh, a lot of things are first class in C sharp as well. Yes, but so, why? We but, happen because. Oh, I see. Uh, yeah, yes. We happen mm. because of the electrons that's coming from. from right. Perhaps so. John? Let's make another comment on, on the need for a, a new language. To do with memory allocation. One of the consequences of programming in that functional <laughs> style is that uh, there's a great deal of copying of data structure. That is, um, when you, uh, you don't modify the structure, you create a slightly different copy. And for that to be efficient, it's vital that memory allocation is very fast indeed. In a language like Haskell, then uh, the entire implementation is constructed so that memory can be allocated in a very small number of instructions. And if you compare the memory allocation rate of Haskell programs and Java programs, say, it can be 10 times higher than Haskell programs. Write the same program in C or Java. Um, and you know, if you're calling malloc, you allocate. Oh, you can't call malloc. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> you're going to go right, 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 yeah. Yeah, good point. Thank you. Joe. Another reason for new language was, was uh, I, I was programming Java. I probably shouldn't say that, but I programmed Java two weeks ago. Sorry, we won't tell anyone, Joe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs>